Hello, uh, Kath Price here again and um, today we're going to talk about the birds of prey in Shropshire. Um, when I was a child in, in the early 60s and interested in birds, really birds of prey was something you just didn't see. Um, the occasional kestrel, um, but very, very little else. So we're lucky now, there's a lot more, but let's have a look at the whole situation around birds of prey. They're an iconic species, several iconic species actually, um, beautiful things and um, apex predators. So they're a really important indicator of how wildlife is doing. Of course, they're, they're, they're part of our culture. They appear in art and poetry and and words and everything that surrounds us think of how many times we say he's hawk-eyed or um you know we use terminology hawk-like aggressive you know we we use hawks as a metaphor but you know we can actually watch them now which is brilliant but we used to have these metaphors, but we didn't have the birds to watch. So art is important. It, it, it brings it home to us, the sheer glory of them. This is um, one of Cindy Lee Wright's illustrations for Simon King's book, Rewild Yourself. And the words are from Gerald Manley Hopkins' poem, The Wind Hover, which is absolutely beautiful poem. And if you don't know it, I recommend you go out and read it right now. Well, when you finish watching this, obviously. Hawks used to be a central part of life. Uh, in medieval times, they were a way of catching your dinner, and everybody used every everybody was into hawking. Um, it wasn't just the nobility, though. Obviously, they were particularly keen on it. Um, it was un not uncommon to see somebody bring their hawk to church with them, or out carrying their hawk like you'd be walking a dog. So. They were everywhere. And uh, the Book of St. Albans from 1486 tells you what you're allowed to have for your station in life. So emperor had an eagle, uh, a king was allowed a gerfalcon, a prince could have a peregrine, a lady would have a merlin. And then you get the, the lower echelons of society and a yeoman could have a goshawk priests could have a sparrow hawk and a kestrel for a knave and I'm sure everybody has read, either read the book Barry Hines kestrel for a knave or seen the film and that's where it comes from um, if you were the lowest in society you could have a kestrel to hawk with but everybody had one and they brought home dinner for the pot it was pre-shotguns and people needed to be able to catch things but then, of course, the, our ally in hunting, if you like, became the enemy. Once they'd invented shotguns, there was no more need for hawks. And the hunting estates, the shooting estates, employed gamekeepers. And gamekeepers were prone to eradicate anything that had sharp teeth or a, or a hook beak. So totally indiscriminately, <clears throat> they would uh, wipe out any hawks that were in the area, any falcons that were in the area, as well as things like stoats and foxes, um, anything they thought that might be detrimental to the, the crop, if you like, of huntable birds, pre predominantly pheasants, grouse, partridge, these sort of things. So after the World Wars, First World War and Second World War, um, gamekeepers really had thinned out a lot. There weren't so many of these big hunting estates and there weren't so many people um, willing to be a gamekeeper. So gamekeeping thinned out a bit, but then we got the, uh, the hawks got the double whammy, if you like, after the war, um, chemical insecticides and pesticides became popular with the farmers and the, particularly the organochlorines, um, DDT, things like this, 
heavily hit raptor populations again. So as we look through the species, we'll discuss how they declined and what the population, population levels are like now. In Shropshire, we can actually see all of these birds of prey apart from the golden eagle and the white-tailed eagle. We might be lucky one day and see them flying over. Um, I think that's a little way in the future, but you can actually, you could guarantee, you could spot all of them with luck within a year. So these are the hawks and then we get um, an osprey on the left and then the falcons. So we've got a good range of them in Shropshire. We've got lucky that in Shropshire we've got still a very rural county and we have places that you can actually spot these things. Obviously quite often you see them flying and guides like this are quite handy to learn the silhouettes of them. So quite often all you can see is a little black shape in the sky. Um, it can be difficult if you haven't got something to gauge the size by. Um, I can remember seeing golden eagles flying um, upon Mull with ravens mobbing them and I was absolutely astounded how tiny the raven looked beside it. But if you haven't got that comparison it can be quite hard to see um, which, which hawk you've got, which hawk or falcon you've got. So, but it, it does help. So we'll start with the buzzard. And this is a, a common buzzard. And they really got quite badly hit by gamekeepers. <clears throat> Records from the uh, late 1800s, um, Forrest says, even now, a year seldom passes without one or more being sent to the bird stuffers from different parts of the county. Beckwith only records a single nest, which was near Ludlow, and that was in 1863. The keepers killed the whole family. It was, however, one of the few counties where the bird wasn't entirely eliminated, so a few breeding pairs survived in the fastness of Clun Forest towards the end of the 19th century. They increased after World War I, when there were less keepers around, and then they were hit again when myxomatosis wiped out a large part of the population of rabbits. So that's 1954 onwards. The slow recovery from that was hampered by the, the, the pesticide residues, uh, the DDT residue. In 1983, the BTO and Shropshire Ornithological Society survey recorded around 60 pairs breeding in the county. By 1990, we were up to 300 pairs. It was still suffering from illegal persecution though. Shropshire's quite a black spot for raptor poisoning, buzzards being carrion feeders, or partly carrion feeders, could be badly hit by this. There was a major expansion again, in, particularly in the southwest of the county, after the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food set up a campaign against illegal poisoning. That was in 1991. And they're now breeding throughout the county. Uh, I read something on the RSPB chat the other day. Somebody had seen 50, upwards of 53 buzzards flying over the house in Bildwas. 53 in the space of 90 seconds. So this is a bird that's done very well. This is a bird that we never saw when I was a child. You, know, you dreamed of seeing a buzzard, but there they are. They have quite a distinctive sound. Sorry. <laughs> Mewing call. And they'll call in flight, you'll see them circling around and hear that mewing sound and know it's, it's a buzzard. It's a medium sized hawk, it's quite broad winged, its tail is shorter than the width of its wing. So that's one way of telling it. And 
obviously you can if you hear it calling have a look up and see if you can see them circling they're, they're quite communal you can see several together quite often they circle on the thermals to hunt and they're just as often seen perched um i used to go down to south wales to newport when i was going to college and i'd be quite often traveling early in the morning and there's a bit of dual carriageway outside of newport um coming down from abergavenny and you'd see a buzzard on just about every lamp standard obviously watching the road looking for things that have been killed during the night looking for carrion so quite often see this one perched they'll also walk around on grassland and fields um plowed fields looking for something to eat they, 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 their prey is rabbits small rodents carrion worms beetles in it just about anything like that uh, here's one enjoying a, 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 a tasty worm it's not below them they they they're, they're quite cheerful cheerfully eat small stuff or big stuff the plumage is very variable so as you can, you can see from from this picture the they go from the sort of standard brown on the top right there to quite dark browns to, to very pale ones so um it it can be quite confusing in flight they they have quick stiff wing beats they tend to do a sort of flap flap glide sort of thing and the fingers if you like the the the, the primaries on the wings are, are rather rounded in eagles they tend to be pointed so um it, one way if you're up in scotland it can be hard to tell which you've got and that's one way of of deciding and they nest in trees they like in small woodlands um or forests with access to open land where they which is their hunting territory so this is a, a fairly typical buzzard's nest it's a big nest of sticks um in in a tree in in woodland but quite a few of the other hawks have similar similar looking nests so it's always worth having a listen and and watching to see what comes and goes shropshire has now adopted the buzzard as its county bird and this is the sign for the shropshire way footpath with a lovely buzzard on it so it's it's a good we can have a look at those and you'll soon learn to identify a flying buzzard <clears throat> this is our smallest hawk this is a sparrow hawk and a lot of garden bird watchers really hate them um it was one of the one of when i was working at the boathouse one of the the main things people would talk to me about was feeding their garden birds and birds in their garden and one of the main complaints was those dreadful sparrow hawks um they live entirely on small to medium sized birds and they hunt with ruthless rapacity but they're not very good at it they're not brilliant at it so um they probably miss a strike more often than they hit one they hunt by concealment and ambush um they they'll fly along the back of a hedge and then quickly dive over it to to grab a bird that's there um i once had an interesting experience when i was uh, i was working on my compost heap and it's backed by a high dense hedge and i was surprised by a, a, a song thrush shooting past me and as i was being surprised by the song thrush and looking at it um i got clobbered by the sparrow hawk that was pursuing it that <laughs> dived over the hedge um very slightly, slightly closer view of a sparrow hawk than you really want um they they're quite they're quite sneaky like that so it helps if, if if you're bothered by them with your garden birds to put your feeders well out in the open so there's nowhere they can sneak up from it doesn't always help um we had one of those sort of cage feeders over a over a tube tube feeder of peanuts and it was full of green finches one morning and they all thought sparrowhawk came through and they all flew into the hedge apart from one which obviously thought it was quite safe in this cage and um, unfortunately it wasn't the sparrowhawk landed on the top stuck its leg through the bars and grab, grabbed the green finch so yeah they they're sneaky things um but 
remember that there is a predator prey balance the numbers of predators are controlled by the number of prey rather than the other way around and if we didn't have them we'd be up to our armpits and baby blue tits in no time um small birds breed, breed large broods several times in in the summer and really all these are doing is mopping up the weaker ones so it's, it, it's not something to worry about they survived persecution by gamekeepers quite well because woodland was conserved as cover for game predators such as pine martins and goshawks were driven to extinction they were still widely distributed in the mid 20th century but by 1964 they were getting scarce they were badly hit by the organochlorines the ddt particularly vulnerable to toxic residues in prey because because they're hunting on small birds which of course take the insects ddt residues are intensified concentrated in their bodies and then the hawk eats the small bird and it gets a, a big dose of it all in one go so they were they were badly hit by that after use of the ddts and things were restricted in the 1984 they recovered quite rapidly and they're now breeding throughout the county they're rather an elusive breeder so very hard to monitor much more visible in the winter as they're largely sedentary they're probably rather the breeding numbers are probably underestimated um it's it's a bit of a vague estimation anyway um they reckon between 530 and 1600 pairs of breeding in the county um it's quite a quite a wide gap really um there's not much you can confuse it with it's uh, obviously if you see it sitting it's it's very clearly obvious it makes a noise like this rather peevish high-pitched sort of noise for a splendid bird like that isn't it um they they in flight they have powerful wing beats they've got blunted rounded wing, wing tips unlike the kestrel and a square tail with sharp corners unlike a goshawk goshawk's really the only thing you can fuse it with and of course a goshawk is very much larger but like i said it can be hard to tell the size um they do the flap flap glide thing slightly undulating flight and they're usually silent outside of the breeding season so the peevish squeaks really are only in the springtime the male one is known as a musket and it's considerably smaller than the female and this means they feed on rather different prey so the, the the musket will take um things really up to the size of a blackbird probably and the, 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 the sparrow hawk, the female, will take uh, slightly larger things up to the size of a pigeon. Um, they nest in trees and they build a nice new nest every year. So in the springtime, listen out for the peevish squeaking. <clears throat> Here's another bird I really thought I'd never see. As a, as a child, um, red kites were restricted to very small numbers in mid Wales. Um, one flew past my window in 2013 i was sitting having my breakfast looking out and through the garden at ground level goes a red kite and i was absolutely i was sitting there going totally gobsmacked never thought i'd see one like that they recolonized from wales in the latter part of the 20th century as as the welsh population grew there's been dis dispersing young looking for new territories um the breeding in Shropshire is confined really to the southwest hills of the country. And the first fledged young from a Shropshire nest was in 2006. The, they nest in trees, so quite hard to see when they're, when they're breeding. Um, the amount of foraging birds we see across the county and the distribution of them suggests that breeding will become more, more widespread as long as the habitat's there, there's possibly around 50 breeding pairs by 2014. 
the youngsters, particularly females, will move considerable distances. Um, birds from release sites in Galloway and the Chilterns could easily come into Shropshire. They're quite unmistakable. The colouring of the forked tail makes them really, you could, there is nothing else you can mistake them for. Um, they have a, a buoyant, leisurely flight and they constantly twist their tail like a rudder. Um, really, really quite different from, from anything else. They feed um, largely on carrion, but they'll also take, um, take main uh, small life food up to, um, up to a rabbit sized, but mostly carrion. <clears throat> this is one of the feeding stations at uh, near release sites for, for, for red kites. This one's the one up in Galloway. And this is, so these are places you can actually see large amounts of kites, usually together with buzzards and various corvids. Um, it's a great way to see them, but it never feels quite natural, I have to admit. I, 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 I mean, if I see one flying over um, in the wild, if you like, it, it, it's a much bigger hit. <clears throat> They'll quite often steal food from other birds. And because it's a carrion feeder, it still falls prey to illegal poisoning. And, and also the problem that... Um, rat poison and mouse poison can leave corpses of these creatures lying around that can also rather wallop the kites. If you want to if you want to see them in in Shropshire, the Oni Valley is a very good place to see them. Um, but they're cropping up all over the county. We regularly see them over Ellesmere now and uh, it's just lovely to see them back. One we don't see up here <clears throat> is the goshawk. This is, um, they call it a northern goshawk, just to be pedantic. Um, and Shropshire actually has one of the healthiest populations in England. They became rare well before all the other raptors, mainly from habitat loss, um, from woodland clearance. They were already scarce by the beginning of the 19th century, and then they were relentlessly persecuted by the gamekeepers. And this led to their extermination in all of Britain by the end of the 19th century. However, they got a bit of a helping hand from man um, because after the Second World War, falconry as a sport, as a hobby, rather than as a means to get food, was becoming more popular. And the goshawk is a popular bird for falconers. Um, a lot, some of them escaped and others were deliberately released to provide um, to, so they nested in the wild to provide chicks for the sport so deliberate releases added to the numbers and there were these feral populations bred sporadically all, o all over the, the, the country really large forestry plantations from 1960s and 70s all those conifer plantations you see offered new nesting sites they, they don't mind nesting in conifer forest um, and also protection from gamekeepers the the forestry commission were owning large areas of woodland that weren't managed for game they did um the forest commission map monitored and managed for these birds from about 1987. Um, we possibly earlier breeding records in the county, but um, nothing much really, 1978, 79, that sort of time. But once the Forest Commission started looking after them, um, there was a steady increase in numbers. They're very hard to monitor because they're very, very elusive and secretive breeders. Um, if you'd been persecuted like they had, you'd be secretive too. Um, they like, they nest deep in the forest. They, they, they don't show themselves off very much. They're not very noisy. Though you can see them possibly in the springtime, they'll display over their breeding sites. It's a, a, a slightly younger bird, you can tell by the slightly paler eye. And 
this is this is the nest in in thick woodland so you're not going to just happen across one chances are watch out above above the potential breeding ground because they they will um they'll display they'll spiral in spring and also when they're hunting to feed their young they're a bit more obvious populations estimated about 31 to 50 breeding pairs and they're largely sedentary they don't they don't move far from their breeding ground and hopefully the population will continue to increase notice its feet they have lovely feet they have these particularly strong pointed claws long claws um they're they're feeding on um birds and mammals up to pheasant or hare size mainly pigeons and corvids um the gamekeepers rather missed a trick shooting them all because the other thing of course that they did not like was corvids and the goshawks were actually controlling them quite well they've got the, these the, the the feet though with these needle-like claws they, they're for grasping agile prey for grasping birds they're quite spectacular they perch hidden in the forest and then they ambush they can store and stoop, soar and stoop, but they're mainly a woodland hunter. They've got longer pointed wing, more pointed wings than a sparrowhawk. It's a, the lower body is bulkier. They sort of they've got rather heavy hips, and the tail has rounded corners rather than straight ones. Thicker neck. It's altogether much bigger, chunkier bird. They've got quite a thick neck, and quite a protruding head. And if you want to go and look for one you can around Clunton coppice in the springtime you might be lucky with a distant view but absolutely lovely things another one I never thought I'd see hen harriers don't breed in Shropshire another lovely thing they were once widespread bred in a wide range of habitats not many records of from the 19th and 20th century by the 20th century, the British breeding range was largely just in all in the Outer Hebrides. They were recorded nesting clon forest in the 1930s, though. The range increased after World War II, with the less gamekeeping going on, and the Welsh breeding population from the 1960s onwards was quite healthy. Local you know, sightings in in Shropshire started to increase um the one or two most years from 1962 to about 1973 um and then every year since then they've been seen here it's a winter migrant to visit a passage migrant probably from the welsh population cyclings are mostly of single birds um and Clusters of them seen around, clusters of sightings around along Mind and Cypress Stones and Wixel Moss in the north. They like heather, taller grasses, rushes, and they prey on small mammals and birds. So they, they usually quite, they hunt quite low to the ground. The English breeding population is still perilously low. Um, it might be helped by a reduction of grazing in the uplands less sheep on the uplands will mean there's more habitat suitable for their prey um, they're still illegally persecuted particularly on grouse moors um, but the welsh population is doing quite well and they might spread into structure from there the females are known as ringtails the males are this lovely grey colour with the black wind tips and a darker leading edge, uh, trailing edge to the wing. And then the females that you can see here have this banded tail. So females and youngsters are known as ring tails. It's hard to tell one from the other. Usually seen flying low and slow over on tree, uh, open countryside. And their wings go up in a sort of distinctive V shape. Um, and have rather owl-like faces of forward-pointing eyes and this is the wonderful um, spring display pair bonding 
through sky dancing and they they the male will pass a food item to the female in the air absolutely wonderful thing to see i mean you just need to nip over into um into wales and you'll have a chance of seeing that there but in this country we're gonna to have to wait a little bit longer in this in this county we'll have to wait a little longer um but you never know <clears throat> we also get occasional migratory marsh harriers coming through this one's on them um, which moss um they're an absolutely lovely bird the only known record of them breeding in shropshire is from Preston upon the wheeled moors in 1988 but they didn't even manage to raise any young there passage birds are increasing though there are 30, 31 records since 2000 um the majority of them from mix wakes or moss um the only record of two birds together um there was a pair at wakesall moss in april in 2008 and another pair seen at wall farm in the autumn the same year most of them passing through the end of april and may into may and then they're returning early early to mid august um there is suitable nesting habitat for them here but not yet <laughs> we also get montague's harriers but they're very 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 uncommon very very rare um, only two modern records. Ospreys, though, we're seeing more often. They're a, a passage migrant. Adults of breeding age, that's from three or five years upwards, tend to pass through fairly quickly, heading for their breeding grounds. But the immature ones, the two two year old, three year olds, sometimes linger. So these are another one they were persecuted to extinction in england by 1848 and then they were lost in Sh Sh scotland as a breeding bird in 1916 but a pair returned to scotland in um 1954 um and then by increased a bit so by 1973 there were there were 10 pairs breeding there natural recolonization and deliberate translocation brought the first breeding birds to England for 150 years. Um, and the, this is um, translocated birds at Rutland Water. They've been breeding in, in Wales from 2004. And all of these birds, remember, are migrants. They winter in Senegal, that sort of area in Africa. And as they migrate, they tend to follow rivers. So quite often you'll see them following the Severn and this brings birds up to places like Chelmarsh, Venus Pool, and you'll also see them over the Mears and Mosses area, um, possibly Wood Lane. Um, they're rather distinctive in, in flight, they, they have a, a sort of rather sharp elbowed look. They feed exclusively on fish. Uh, it's actually quite interesting, they've, they've got a reversible outer toe and sharp spicules on the soles of their feet so they can grasp slippery fish which is a marvelous adaptation really isn't it so watch out for them um march to may august to october and see if you can see one flying past two other buzzard species again rare winter visitors rare passage sorry the, the roughly buzzard is a rare winter visitor very rare winter visitor it tends to breed in high latitudes in North America and Eurasia. And it's quite hard to tell from a common buzzard. This is up on, up, up on the top left here. And the distinguishing feature is that it's got feathery legs. Um, there's only five accepted modern records between 1952 and 2016. If, 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 if you think it's one, do try and get a photograph that shows its legs well. Colouring is difficult because remember the buzzards have quite a variable um, colour morph. The honey buzzard on the bottom right here is actually quite a different looking bird. This is a, a passage migrant, um, very uncommon, but a pair bred in secret for several years from 1995 in Forestry Commission Woodland in the south of the county and they, they raised young every year till about 2000. 
um, another, they fledged another two in 2008, but there's been no further record of them. They like to nest in high conifers. And it's, it's probable that it's an under-recorded bird. You know, you see a, a big bird, it looks a bit like a buzzard. You tend to assume it's a buzzard. Worth a close look. These are quite exciting birds. They very rarely see them perched or on open ground. They stay in deep forest. They've got wonderful display routine. They fly in a U curve and at the top of it, it lifts its wings up above its head and shakes them. So it's, that, it's very distinctive. So if you see a bird doing that, almost certainly it's going to be a honey, honey buzzard. It flies with slow, deep wing beats, usually low, hunts, hunts low to the ground because what it's looking for is wasp and bee nests. These are, these are what they live on. Here's one having a really good time with a, with a, with a, a, a bee nest. They, rather, rather weak looking beak because of the, their insectivorous habits and, and, and feathery legs. Glides with its, its wings held rather flat rather than the, the V shape of a common buzzard or a, a rough leg buzzard. And it, it, it twists and turns its tail in the same sort of way a kite will. Of course, totally different shape from a kite, so you're not going to mistake it. Do watch out for them though, it'd be lovely to have them back as a breeding bird. On to our falcons now. These, the most common is the kestrel. It's, it's a resident, it breeds throughout the county and it's a, it's a lovely little thing. Remember, this is the knaves bird. Um, not really a very good hunting bird for the falconers. They tend to live largely on um, voles and mice, so they're not going to fill the pot for you. Rather a, a, a distinctive call, if I can just find it for you. Yeah, sort of squeaking cry almost. Um, they were a little more lucky uh, with the DDT poisoning because because the voles and the mice didn't tend to amass it in the same way as the small birds did. So they survived that better. They were persecuted. They have a hooky beak, therefore you know they got shot. But like I say, they live largely on voles and mice, so a um, bit, bit of a mistake there really. We used to see these were the hawk we saw as, as kids, these were really the only bird of prey that we saw and there were quite a lot about then. They've declined since mm, the mid 1980s really. Probably you know, the BBS record uh, breeding bird survey records a 28% decline between 1995 and 2014 in the West Midlands. It's widely seen, but you know, it is declining. Possible reasons for that are um, people using more anticoagulant rodent baits. These taking small, you know, if 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 the small mammal is still running about and it, it's taken bait, it'll be passed on to the falcon. Habitat impoverishment is a problem. Um, you know, intensification of agriculture, there's just not so many small mammals running around. It's led to them rather hunting on, uh, on the verges. It used to be always you would see them on the motorway verges. If you couldn't see one anywhere else, drive down the motorway and there'd be a kestrel there. Um, mowing of verges throughout the summer means that the prey aren't, the, the, the mice and the voles aren't using the verge so much, so it's a bit hard on the, on, the, on the kestrels. Lack of suitable nest sites can also be a problem. It's a whole nest, so it's in competition with things like jackdaws and grey squirrels. They will take to nest boxes uh, quite happily. Um, here's one with a, with a, a, a good clutch of eggs in a nest box. 
it, it, it might be that a, a, a program of putting up nest boxes for them would, would help to stop the decline. They're not a particularly fussy eater or all that fussy about nesting sites. So, um, it's a concern that the population is, is declining. There's a nice quotation from Michelle Freiter, who wrote the species account in the um, the, the 2019 SOS, uh, Shropshire Monological Society, the Atlas. And she says, if current practices are making the landscape inhospitable, even to a versatile species like the kestrel, it suggests the loss of biodiversity is fast becoming critical. We would do well to heed the warning. This isn't a fussy bird, but we're losing them. used to be commonly known as the wind hover. This is the one the poem was about. And you can see them quite often with their distinctive hover. They've got narrower, straighter wings than a sparrowhawk and a very different hunting method. So it'll hunt from a perch. We quite often see them on the telegraph pole outside the, um, outside the gate, um, but it hovers and it has the fanned out tail and the bird is in motion, but the head will be absolutely stationary. So it's focused completely on that mouse or vole that it wants for its dinner. So it'll hang in the air, focus it completely on it, and then, then dive on it. They have a rather flappy flight. They don't look very powerful. The males are sort of russet brown back, grey head, grey tail. Females are sort of warm brown they're finely barred the, the tail is is they've got the, 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 a, a barred tail rather than a, a plain tail and they don't have the gray on them much less gray about them so they're both absolutely lovely things um the the youngsters haven't they got big eyes the youngsters when they're fledged are really noisy so it's if you hear a fuss like remember that squeaking noise they make if you hear a fuss like that, it's well worth having a look because they're just lovely little birds. Even more spectacular, if you like your falcons, or the hobbies. Now these are a summer visitor. Britain's on the northwest corner of their breeding range, so these are a much more southern thing. Um, and really in the 1950s they were pretty much restricted to the southeast corner of England. but. They've, they've increased with, with warmer weather and post-war development led to more sand and gravel pits being dig, dug and quite a lot of these have flooded and provided habitat for dragonflies. And dragonflies are the favourite prey of hobbies. There's fairly scanty records of confirmed breeding in modern times until about 1983. They're fairly elusive breeders they nest late. Um, they nest late so that the, their fledglings um, leave the nest when the recently fledged swallows, martins, swifts are flying. This is another favourite prey of theirs. They nest in scattered trees um, are on arable farmland. They usually use an old crow's nest and because of the, the nature of their nesting sites and the lateness of breeding, they tend to be missed by, by, by the surveys. They don't tend to be very noisy until August when the, the young are at the late nesting, early fledgling stage. <clears throat> they have been, um, they've been co confirmed breeding in scattered sites throughout the county and uh, populations probably more than 70 pairs in a good year now. Um, it fluctuates with the weather because of the, the, the dragonfly availability. Large numbers can be seen at, at Wixel Moss, um, particularly early in the season uh, when the, the passage birds are also present. So you can actually see quite, quite big groups of them. Long Mind and Venus Pool are other good places to look. This, this one has uh, naturally caught a dragonfly in midair. It'll clip the wings off with its beak and then eat it like a stick of rock as it flies. 
An absolutely spectacular piece. Look at that. Rather uh, a slim falcon. Uh, peregrines tend to be much chunkier. They've got those long, narrow, pointed wings. They look like a, a large, slow motion swift, really. The, the wings bend back like that. Of course, a dashing flight. They've got short, square cut tail. They've got the red feathers, like the pet wearing a short pair of red trousers, and rather noticeable mustachio stripes on their faces. Long, they fly, this dashing flight with the long sweeps high in the sky. And the swept back wings. It's wonderful to see them. It's worth going. Go up to Waitzel Moss in early summer and you'll see them soaring round. Absolutely lovely things. Quite spectacular. Here they are at the nest and um, we'll just make a little hobby noise so you know what they sound like. They will take um, to artificial nests if, if there aren't enough crow nests available or the crow nests or have crows in them. And it may a bit like a hanging basket with a bit of moss in it. And they'll, they'll nest in these quite happily. Uh, this just a um, little diagram from the Hawk and Owl Trust that shows you where to put your uh, artificial nests or um, assistive, assistive nests in a tree for different species and you can find this online and it's quite an interesting thing to know because it also indicates where in a tree to look for a particular species and there it goes look at that nice red trousers nice drop on its face long curved back swept wings absolutely fantastic bird and this is the chunkier peregrine now remember this is truly spectacular if you thought the hobby was good a peregrine is really really something else they're very widely distributed um right across the northern hemisphere really but quite scarce like all apex predators there's not room for that many of them they weren't recorded breeding in shropshire right through the 1800s or or really only up until the the 1960s during World War II, it became legal to kill them because it was thought they were taking um, messenger pigeons that they, they, they used as a communication during the war. Um, numbers declined um, before the war, there were at least 820 pairs in the United Kingdom. Declined during the war and then increased again. But remember the DDT problems? Uh, numbers absolutely plummeted. These are birds that feed on other birds. So remember the concentration of DDT was building up. It led, if not to direct poisoning, to thinning of the eggshells. So the birds were prone to, the, the eggs could crack easily or break during incubation. So it what not necessarily the direct poisoning of the birds, but the lack of breeding success really hit them. They were down to 360 pairs in the United Kingdom by 1963. There was a, a, a ban on, on, on the pesticides and, and special protection for these birds by the Wildlife and Countryside Act in 1981, and a dramatic increase in them in Wales, which overspills into Shropshire. There was a sudden and sustained increase in sightings in Shropshire from about 1983, particularly in the Western Uplands. And by 1997, we had 10 breeding pairs in the county. They're all in working or disused quarries. This is their equivalent. Of, we don't have a lot of cliffs in Shropshire, if you think about it. But the quarry makes quite a reasonable substitute. Also, feral pigeons were increasing, which is a, a, a really good food supply for them. This is a, a, a natural cliff nest. Any natural cliffs were very quickly colonised. Um, 
between 1998 and 2014, they were breeding in 29 different locations. It's now estimated to be around 1,500 pairs breeding in the UK. That's from the 2014 survey, so they might even increase from since then. They'll tolerate disturbance from working machinery and even human presence. They breed it, they'll breed quite happily in a working quarry. There's a, a, a wonderful instance of one that was nesting on a rock ledge surrounded by an active motocross track. You know, they, they're not really worried. Since 1998, over 500 young have fledged in Shropshire. The trouble is, they, there's really for that population increase, there's, there's not enough natural nest sites. So they're taking to unnatural ones, if you like, tall buildings. As far as a peregrine's concerned, it's a cliff. And if it's in a city, it's probably got a lot of feral pigeons as well. So it's got everything they want. This one is on a, cathedral, a church in Camberwell in the middle of London. Um, I used to go past it regularly. It's not where you would expect to find something as iconically wild as a peregrine falcon, but the place is absolutely stuffed with feral pigeons, so they have quite an easy life there. Nobody's likely to shoot them, and they just go by unnoticed almost. It's always worthwhile if you're looking, wandering through a city or a town, look up, look at those church spires. You might well see one of these. They have been known to use old corvid nests as well. And um, in, in, in Shropshire, we had one of the few authenticated records of tree nesting peregrines. The, the, the lack of natural sites, the, the cliff sites, isn't putting them off. Of course, they have, they, 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 they have this wonderfully spectacular um, hunting pattern they, they i mean well worth seeing them um when 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 they're flying and hunting you know, particularly when when they're feeding young you, they, they become quite obvious even over cities they 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 have this this wonderful um this wonderful soar and stoop they'll spiral up and up and up high above the prey then fold the wing up wings up so they're going to a, an arrow shape and then into a torpedo shape and come down at the prey at upwards of 80 miles you know they can go up to they reckon 200 miles an hour um going for thing, thing, things like pigeons uh, thrushes small gulls all sorts of things they also use a fast horizontal pursuit to to catch birds the uh, little thing I'd, I'd just like to read you from a wonderful book called Wings Over the Valley by John Green and he writes about peregrines flying. Um, the way it flies with unhurried determination and confidence conveys its power. Its aerodynamic body of feathered steely sinew casts its shadow racing over the ground like a freed soul. It knows it has no enemy to fear but man. These are spectacularly confident, chunky, strong birds. Lovely slate, they, they, both sexes are similar. They have a slate gray upper parts, um, barred under parts, it's white with the fine barring on it, white cheeks with a mustache stripe, broad mustaches this time. And the female, of course, still bigger than the male. If you want to watch out for them in Shropshire, try Titterton Clee, Planman of Rocks, around the Rekin, Hawkston. These places are off of cliffs and also don't forget the towns and cities. On to our smallest fog, and this is one of my favourites, I think they're great. This is a, a, a Merlin and it's a scarce winter visitor really. They don't, don't possibly see them having bread on, on the Long Mind, but uh, really, most of ours come in from the open high ground along the Welsh borders. And in, in winter time, you'll see them over, over farmland um, in, in valleys. They, they come down from the heights to, to hunt in rather more sheltered places. 
possible nesting on the long wind, we're not sure about. They, they, they're very easily disturbed. Um, they got hit by the organochlorides, the DDTs again, and they're also hit by habitat loss and overgrazing in the, the uplands. One of the main problems is that with, with, with the um, intensive grazing of uplands is it cuts down the habitat for meadow pipits and that's really what the, the main prey species for, for merlins. Reduced sheep numbers since 2000 has led to an increase. Um, they're, 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 they are recovering. Um, there were a couple of pairs in Shropshire 2004-2008 but the nests, like I say, they're easily disturbed and the nests were the nest failed. They hunt close to the ground. They nest. They can nest on the ground or in in, in small trees. Um, like I say, very easily disturbed by um, even dog walkers, um, people hiking in the hills. They don't really go in much for aerial display. They're usually skimming over the heather and heathland, trying to flush the the, the meadow pipits. This is the, the male one. The, the, he's a, a, a dinky little thing. He's a, a bit like a tiny peregrine, really, but 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 rather finer built. The win winter populations of them, we, we get migrants in from Iceland as well, and, and coming down from Scotland. So increased chance of seeing them in the winter. Um, like I say, dinky little, little falcon. Um, the female is more brown and they have a sort of flickering flight, dashing horizontal pursuit of, of, of prey. Rather lovely things. You find them on the long mind in the summer and it would be nice to see an increase of those as a, as a breeding bird. So where are we going to go and see raptors? You want to go and look for them. Um, rather than just happening across one. Uh, Wixel moss is brilliant. You can see, um, remember the harriers are coming there. You can see all those hobbies there in the springtime. Um, brilliant place to see them. Uh, Long Mind, the uplands are populated by uh, the, the, the merlins in the winter. Um, you might be lucky to see peregrines hunting here. Um, all of these places are good for, for buzzards and for kites. Um, makes, makes a lovely day out as well. It's a brilliant place to go to. Titterston Clee, absolutely lovely. Again, very good site for, for the kites and the, the buzzards and, um, and the peregrines. Clunton Coppice uh, for the, the more woodland orientated species. And Venus Pool, which is a Shropshire Ornithological Society site and you'd need a a permit from them to use the hides there but this is another good place to see particularly the migrants and um, offers, offers a chance of seeing the, seeing the ospreys. So lots of places around Shropshire but you know wherever you are be prepared to if you look up when you hear a fuss in the sky it could be the raptors making noise or it could be birds other birds mocking raptors often corvids will attack crows the crows and um, ravens will attack buzzards and harriers and things so look up when you hear a noise it sounds like somebody having a fight in the sky always look up because you never know in the middle of it all there might be a raptor and it might just be a buzzard but it might be something else so there's a wonderful range of them and they're here in Shropshire we can see them but what can we do to help them. Responsible behaviour around potential nesting sites is really important. Remember those merlins that tried nesting on Citizen Clee? They were disturbed by principally by bird watchers, but also people going orienteering, um, people walking dogs, people hiking, very, very easily disturbed. So if you're in an area 
that looks likely to hold populations of this sort of bird, please don't go close to them. If you see one, don't try and get close to it during the nesting season. Um, very easily put off their nests. The West Mercia police have um, an Operation Owl, which is uh, to engage the help of the public against wildlife crime. Recognise, record and report crime against raptors. Even just this year, poison bait has been put out on Titterton Clee and killing raptors. It's not only dangerous, I mean, whatever the species it's been put out for, it can kill any of them, particularly the kites and the buzzards that carry and feeders, but it's also dangerous for people's dogs, um, for foxes, for all sorts of other wildlife. So if you see anything that you think looks like trapping or poisoning of any wild bird, but raptors particularly, um, get in contact with West Mercia Police. Um, if you see anybody behaving suspiciously in areas that you think there might be raptor nests, again, get in touch with the Wildlife Crime Unit. Habitat protection is also absolutely vital. These birds, I mean, without their nesting sites, without their feeding sites, they're going to do no good at all. We're not going to get that increase and the increase in other parts of the country aren't going to be reflected by populations developing in Shropshire. So look after habitats all over for them. Even if it's your garden and the bird concern is a sparrow hawk, please don't, um, don't get too upset about them. <laughs> but of course, one of the ways to look after habitat for them is to join Shropshire Wildlife Trust as usual. Um, we look after over 40 reserves, which including big areas in Stiper Stones um, that, that, that are offering good habitat for, for, for raptors. So if you do nothing else, consider signing up. You can do it online. Um, just two hours bird of prey experience you can go on these sort of walk with a hawk sort of things. Cost you around fifty pounds. That's ten whole months of membership for the whole family, or nearly eighteen months if it's if you if if you don't have children. So it's a really good way of doing it. Instead of having two hours looking at a hawk close, you can have twelve whole months of seeing them in the wild, and they're there for us to see. Just keep your eyes open, and they're there absolutely wonderful things to see, fabulous species, and please go out and enjoy them. Go out in the reserves, go out in the countryside, and keep your eyes looking upwards, because you never know what might be there. Thank you very much.